Well, he talked about Canada as an energy and food superpower at a major conference in Ottawa last week. Now Saskatchewan Premier Brad Wall is in Washington to push forward both agendas. Brad Wall, welcome to the show. All right, Thank your you. uh, reported call for a carbon tax to help expedite pipeline approval was raised in the House of Commons by the NDP. Surely you're just talking regulations on oil and gas emissions, or are you becoming an NDP here? <laughs> No, we were talking about oil and gas regulations. We did get to talking about levies, uh, carbon levies, but it was in the following context. I was asked a hypothetical question uh, by a reporter here, a Canadian journalist, who said, if the United States ever introduced a carbon tax or a carbon levy and we harmonized with it, what might it look like? And of course, I made the mistake of speculating on what it might look like. The bottom line is the United States will never uh, introduce a, uh, a carbon tax, I don't believe anyway. Uh, and um, they, they might do other things by regulation, mind you, but they won't do that. So it was a hypothetical answer to the question, and uh, it, it unfortunately was reported as a call for a carbon tax. So now that the NDP have raised it in the House of Commons as a policy alternative for energy uh, in the, the Canadian energy sector, I know for sure it's not the way to go. Okay. I thought you'd want to just refute that. Um, Thank you. Speaking Thank speaking of not so theoretical, I mean, I was wondering, we're getting yeah. close on this Keystone thing. Sooner or later, the, yeah. the White House is signaling that. Are you, are you sensing any change in attitude? You've been down there for a few days now. Well, there is the depth of support in the House has always been there, but of course, they if you talk to senators, they think if there was a vote in the Senate, there would be uh, that 60 plus. That's a pretty magic number uh, in the uh, Senate, which is a bit of a bit of a change. I've met with a number of Democratic senators uh, this uh, uh, this week, and they are strong supporters of Keystone. Um, and those senators that are facing midterm elections in states that would be that would be supportive of Keystone. And remember, the polling is still favorable, very quite favorable to Keystone down here, especially in those states. I think potentially there's some, possibly there's some sort of polit political dynamic at play here uh, that might actually move a decision up. And I'm, I'm probably 60 percent, uh, you know, 60 40 positive on on Keystone getting approved by the president. Very quickly, what was helpful in the State Department, I think, and in, in this week, Ambassador Dewar sent a letter to the administration echoing what was in the most recent State Department uh, report, which basically said, look, if the metric for the president's approval is greenhouse gases can't be increased by Keystone, uh, then uh, then it's it's in our view, the State Department, I'm paraphrasing, it's in their view that this will not add greenhouse gases. In fact, they point out that as more oil moves on rail, uh, the greenhouse gas emissions from rail transportation of oil is actually bigger and and we've come down with the fact from the American Railroad Association that we've been sharing with our friends here uh, and it's a stark one it, in, it, there was 8,000 rail cars moving oil in this country in 2008 last year it was 400,000 that says two things one the oil will be moved anyway and two it's going on to rail uh, and many would argue that a pipeline is is still the best way imperfect but still by far and away the best way to move oil in terms of the environment in terms of uh, efficiency well but the thing of your points well taken that you know we've got to show some green stripes in order to get this pipeline approved and, and Obama wants to see signals of that yeah you're down there you're talking carbon capture the Weyburn project proved uh, there's commercial possibilities here there's clean coal technology that's uh, being perfected in Canada aren't we making pretty solid gains on other fronts maybe if, even if we haven't done oil and gas regulations yet uh, Absolutely. In fact, our coal uh, regulations in terms of limiting the uh, the tons of CO2 that can be emitted per gigawatt are more aggressive on our side of the border than the new U.S. regs. And so yesterday I participated in a symposium uh, on the Hill here uh, that was hosted by four Democratic senators led by Senator Joe Manchin, West Virginia, and Senator Heidi Heidkamp from North Dakota, a big, a big supporters of Keystone, by the way. But, but this was uh, this uh, symposium was focusing on clean coal, and we were able to present. In fact, we had two spots and two different panels. I participated, and then one of our senior officials from Sask Power participated. And you bet it helps on the Keystone side because we're able to say in Saskatchewan that on a per capita basis, you will not find a larger public and private investment in terms of mitigating CO2 than this clean coal project that we're here to talk about it at a place called Boundary Dam 3 near Estevan, Saskatchewan. Yeah. So it does help on the, uh, help us with the bona fides on the environment. And, you know, I, I do think we need to continue to make that case, to say, look, we are serious about these things, witness our actions and our admission that we need to do more and will, uh, but I don't think there is an energy competitor of ours out there, other countries, for example, 
example, that are as committed uh, as we have been and will continue to be on, on the sustainability, the, the need to ensure that energy development is sustainable. Brad, well, there seems to be movement, uh, at least in the House of Commons, there's a sign that they're getting, the federal government's getting close to some sort of nudge to get the railways moving on grain, never mind uh, oil. Uh, what are you expecting? Are you getting any hint of what's coming? I think it's days. I, I do. I mean, we we've been we've been working. Uh, we know they have been. Uh, they've got to be careful in terms of uh, of uh, you know confidentiality ahead of potential legislative instruments. And I'm not sure if that's it or not. It. Of course, there's a break coming up there. But I, I think there's signals that well, more than signals. We know they've been working on this. Both Transport Minister Rate and Agriculture Minister Ritz and uh, the uh, the uh, members of Parliament, obviously, who are representing farmers across this Canada have been engaged, we know that. So I'm, I am hopeful, uh, I can't get much more specific than that, Don, but I, I'm pretty hopeful that we're, we, you know, we're days away well, uh, from, from something. It better be today or tomorrow, because as you point out, there's a two week break in the house coming up and those ships aren't, are getting pretty impatient on the west coast and farmers are getting pretty angry. Why can't they do something today or tomorrow? I don't know the answer to that. I, I mean, I imagine the complexities of legislation of intervening in this sector are not, uh, I imagine there's some complexities there, and, and I don't want to oversimplify things, but I do agree we cannot wait. Uh, you know, we simply cannot wait for reasons we've talked about before in terms of what's happening on the farm, but also what's happening to Canada's brand in terms of being a reliable supplier of food. Uh, we can't lose any more countries who are switching to the United States or somewhere else for their grain purchases. Absolutely. Premier Bradwell, thanks for joining us. Have a good day, Don.